Food is what keeps us alive and what we eat can determine how long we will live. To be honest, in my opinion, food has much less of a role in longevity than people like to think. What's more important is your blood work, because that reflects your inner health. Food is just a means to achieve better blood work and other biomarkers. Some foods are better than others in achieving this, which is where the confusion stems from. In this video, I'm going to outline you my personal evidence-based longevity diet. I'm going to outline you the macros and foods that I eat. I understand that it's going to generate a lot of conflicting opinions in the comment section. A lot of people are going to say, you're not supposed to eat that, you need to eat this food. It's just so many different conflicting opinions out there. You can spare me those comments. This is my evidence-based longevity diet and I have the blood work and other biomarkers to back it up. So if you want to learn it, then make sure you watch until the end because I'm going to outline you the entire formula. I'm going to start with the most controversial macronutrient in longevity, which is protein. It's often thought that eating protein accelerates aging and increases your risk of cancer. Indeed, protein restriction is linked with increased lifespan in animal studies, but it's not more powerful than regular calorie restriction. There's limited evidence that protein intake shortens lifespan in humans. However, there are also risks associated with low protein intake, such as frailty and hip fractures. So with protein, you want to kind of get enough to support bone density and muscle mass, because both of them decline with age and they increase the risk of mortality. The biggest irony would be to die to a hip fracture because you're on a low-protein diet and you're thinking that it's going to extend your lifespan. However, there does appear to be some age-dependent effects on protein and longevity. Dietary protein intake in the elderly is associated with higher lean muscle mass. A 2023 study on protein intake in the elderly people over 85 found that a higher protein intake was linked to lower mortality risk. The highest quartile of protein intake over 19.1% of total calories as protein, was linked to a 56% lower risk of mortality than the lowest quartile, less than 14.7% of total calories as protein. So if you're older than 85, then the higher protein of over 19% of calories from protein appears to be more beneficial, and it does reduce the risk of mortality, mostly because of reducing the risk of frailty and sarcopenia. But what about people who are younger than 85? A 2023 meta-analysis of 14 prospective cohort studies in adults without cardiovascular disease 18% or more of total calories from protein wasn't associated with increased cardiovascular disease death, stroke or myocardial infarction. Another 2020 systematic review and meta-analysis of 32 prospective cohort studies with over 715,000 participants found that a higher protein intake was associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality with the lowest risk found at 15-25% to of total calories as protein. So most of the evidence suggests that a protein intake of 15-25% to is associated with a lower risk of mortality. We don't have data about people consuming higher than that, but a protein intake of 20-25% to is already considered to be high protein. However, the percentages of how much protein you eat matter much less than how much you weigh. Given the fact that protein is supposed to support muscle maintenance into your elderly years, you want to eat just enough, but there's no need to go beyond that. A 2018 meta-analysis of several studies discovered that the maximum benefits of muscle mass are observed at an intake of 0.8 grams per pound per day or 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of lean body mass. There's no benefits eating more than that, but if you're eating less, then you're leaving gains on the table. So I'm aiming for the 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of lean body mass, which for me is around 120 grams of protein per day. On some days it might be higher than that, but I rarely go below that. There's no additional benefits of going above the 1.6 grams per kilogram of lean body mass, but if you're eating less than that, then you are missing out on some of the potential gain for muscle growth. So what kind of proteins do I eat? I'm not a vegan, I'm not a carnivore, I eat a pretty good balance of animal and plant-based proteins with an emphasis on fish, dairy and plant proteins. I do eat meat, but not very often and usually it's game meat. There are also controversial opinions about animal protein and plant protein. In epidemiological studies, meat consumption is often linked to higher mortality and plant protein is linked to lower mortality. The same 2020 meta-analysis of 32 studies found that exact phenomenon. Over 10% of total calories coming from animal protein was linked to a slight increase in mortality risk and over 5% of total calories from plant protein was linked to a decreased risk. My animal protein percentage is probably 15%, but my plant protein percentage is also around 10%. And there is also one critical nuance that determines the outcomes that is related to fats that I'm going to cover later. There are also studies finding that unprocessed meat consumption isn't significantly associated with all-cause mortality or cardiovascular disease. So it's hard to say that eating meat is going to increase your risk of heart disease or cancer in otherwise healthy people because the risk associations aren't that strong and they're mostly epidemiological. But it does appear to be that plant proteins have benefits if you compare them to animal proteins and they yield greater risk reduction. 
Here too, there appears to be some age-dependent effect with animal protein being linked to a lower risk of mortality among the elderly people. The reason is because old people are at a higher risk of malnutrition and frailty, which could be counteracted by animal protein intake more easily. That's because old people are very bad at eating, they subconsciously undereat, they forget their meals, and they don't have the appetite to eat. This is called the anorexia of aging. There are also studies among elderly people finding that plant-based diets are linked to reduced frailty as long as they get enough calories and protein. So the determining factor in all of this appears to be malnutrition and frailty. If you get enough calories and if you get enough protein and you ma maintain enough muscle tissue, then it doesn't really matter what kind of a diet you follow as long as you are meeting those requirements. I personally base my protein and all my food intake based on my biomarkers. The link between animal protein intake and mortality in epidemiological studies is thought to be due to increased risk of heart disease and cancer. The main biomarkers that are affected by animal protein intake and that they are linked to this increase in heart disease and cancer are your blood lipids and IGF-1. There are many others, but these are the main ones. IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1 is a growth factor that promotes muscle growth but is also implicated in cancer and type 2 diabetes. However, both high, over 200 nanograms per milliliter, as well as low, less than 100 nanograms per milliliter of IG-1, are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer mortality, and overall death. The high IG-1 is linked to mortality because of cancer, and low IG-1 is so because of frailty and muscle loss. My IG-1 levels are on the lower end, and around 100, and I haven't seen them above 120 in my blood work. So based on this, my cancer risk is very low, and I'm also not in the risk of frailty or malnutrition. What about heart disease based on the lipids? Cholesterol isn't the most important lipid for assessing cardiovascular disease risk. Even the main health organizations and guidelines acknowledge that the bigger risk factor are lipoproteins, specifically ApoB or apolipoprotein B. It's one of the most atherogenic particles that's thought to be causally linked to heart disease. Normal ApoB levels are considered below 120 mg per deciliter. High ApoB over 140 mg per deciliter is significantly associated with increased risk of all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. The optimal ApoB for preventing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is below 90 mg per deciliter and below 70 mg per deciliter in those with higher risk. The risk of cardiovascular events related to ApoB is higher in younger than in older individuals. So if you're someone who's younger than 40, then for cardiovascular disease prevention, it's better to have your ApoB low. My recent blood work showed that my ApoB levels were 77 mg per deciliter, which is in the low risk category. Of course, there are many other markers that are associated with increased risk of heart disease, such as inflammation, hemoglobin A1c, blood pressure, blood sugar levels, etc. But they're also optimal for me. I want to take a quick break to talk to you about my favorite collagen out there. Collagen peptides have been shown to reverse skin aging in several human clinical trials. They do so because of being much more bioavailable than regular whole food collagen sources. Collagen content in your skin starts decreasing in your 20s already, at a rate of about 10% per decade. So, you should start using collagen already in your 20s, and the sooner you do, the better it is for your skin aging. The brand of collagen I'm using, Nordcode, has the optimal type of collagen peptides in the low molecular weight form. They've also added 5 grams of extra glycine, which is an amino acid responsible for collagen synthesis as well as glutathione synthesis, the powerful antioxidant in the body. The Nordcode Complete Collagen also has vitamin C, which initiates collagen synthesis, and eggshell membrane, which has been shown to support joint function. The collagen is sourced from grass-fed cows from the Alps, so it's one of the highest quality collagens in the world. Head over to livehealthy.com forward slash collections forward slash Nordcode to get a 10% discount with the code SEAM10. Alright, back to the video. Next, let's talk about fats because they're relevant to proteins. For normal physiological functions, it's recommended to get at least 15% of your daily calories from dietary fat. That's going to be about 20 to 30 grams for most people. However, this doesn't appear to be optimal from an all-cause mortality perspective. In the 2017 PURE study done on people from 18 countries across the world, the lowest mortality was seen at a fat intake of 35.3% of total calories. That's a pretty moderate amount of fat, and for most people, it's going to be somewhere between 50 to 70 grams a day. There are also studies finding that men eating 40% of calories as fat have higher testosterone than those eating 20% of calories as fat, but there are no additional benefits beyond 40%. So somewhere between 35 to 40% is optimal from an all-cause mortality perspective and from a hormonal perspective. You don't need to go beyond that, but eating less than that might also be somewhat suboptimal. In total, my own fat intake falls somewhere between there and I'm getting around 70 grams per day. 
in terms of the types of fats I eat, that I'm getting my fats from mostly fish, eggs, dairy, olive oil, and nuts and seeds. That's because these fats, specifically omega-3s and olive oil, are consistently shown to be associated with reduced risk of all-cause mortality, neurodegeneration, and heart disease. A 2017 meta-analysis of 23 prospective studies found that fish and omega-3 fat consumption were inversely associated with all-cause mortality risk. When it comes to omega-3s that I'm aiming for a specific biomarker called the omega-3 index. The omega-3 index measures the amount of omega-3 fats, EPA and DHA in your red blood cells. A low omega-3 index is a risk factor for heart disease and mortality. The optimal omega-3 index associated with the lowest risk of coronary heart disease mortality is between 8 and 12 percent, and less than 4 percent is linked to the greatest risk. Similar associations are found with Alzheimer's disease. So you want to aim for an omega-3 index of at least 8% and up to 12%. My recent test results show that I had an omega-3 index of 9%, which is optimal. For that, I take about 1.5 grams of omega-3s per day, and I eat fish 3-4 to four times a week. Next, I'll cover olive oil, which is the second fat associated with reduced mortality. Higher olive oil intake is linked to a lower risk of heart disease, neurodegeneration, and mortality. A 2022 study on Americans over 28 years of age, which is my age group, saw that those who consumed the most olive oil, over 0.5 tablespoons per day or over 7 grams a day, saw a 19% lower risk of all-cause mortality compared to those who never or rarely consumed olive oil. There are probably other differences between olive oil consumers and non-olive oil consumers that explain these results. But even among olive oil users themselves, higher use of olive oil is associated with a lower risk. An analysis of the PrettyMed study has found that individuals in the highest category of total olive oil intake a mean intake of 56.9 grams per day, had a 35% lower risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the lowest category, a mean intake of 21.4 grams per day. Those in the highest category of extra virgin olive oil intake, 34.6 grams per day, had a 39% lower cardiovascular disease risk. That would be the equivalent of around 2 to 3 tablespoons of olive oil per day. My own olive oil intake is around 2 tablespoons per day. What about saturated fat? A 2020 large Cochrane meta-analysis of 15 randomized controlled trials found that reducing saturated fat intake to less than 10% of total calories was associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease than above that. But after 10%, the risk plateaued. Based on the results, the risk of cardiovascular disease events and mortality starts to increase after 8% of total energy intake from saturated fat, and the risk stays relatively the same from 9 to 13%. This study wasn't based on epidemiological studies but instead on randomized control trials, which are considered a much higher level of evidence. In my opinion, your saturated fat intake matters only to the extent of how it affects your ApoB levels. My ApoB and cholesterol levels are on the lower end, but that's because I'm not eating foods that would raise my ApoB levels. My only source of saturated fats are yogurt and dark chocolate. Interestingly, dairy and dark chocolate intake aren't associated with increased risk of heart disease, and they're often linked to a lower risk, so they're considered neutral, at worst or at best slightly positive. Like I said, I get about 20 to 25% of my calories as protein. Out of that, my saturated fat intake is quite low. I'm getting less than 10% of my calories from saturated fat and mostly from dairy and dark chocolate, which aren't associated with increased risk. And on top of that, my ApoB and cholesterol and inflammation and other cardiovascular disease risk factors are also optimal. Next, let's talk about carbohydrates. In epidemiology, many studies find a U-shaped association between carbohydrate intake and all-cause mortality. A 2018 large meta-analysis in The Lancet found that an intake of 50-55% to of total calories from carbs was linked to the lowest mortality risk. The 2017 Pure study among individuals from 18 different countries across the globe found the lowest mortality at a carbohydrate intake of 50-55% to as well, and a higher risk of mortality above 60%. However, what they find is that the diet quality matters a lot, with an unhealthy high-carb or a low-carb diet being associated with increased risk, and a healthy low-carb or high-carb diet being associated with a lower risk. So the diet quality is the determining factor here. Both unhealthy low-carb and unhealthy low-fat diets are linked to higher risk, whereas healthy low-carb and healthy low-fat diets are linked to reduced risk. However, a carbohydrate intake of 48 to 56% of total calories is associated with the highest expression of an anti-aging protein called clotho. That fits the pattern seen in observational studies, which could also maybe explain some of the results. My carbohydrate intake is everything that's left over from my protein and fat intake. So I get 35% as fat, 20-25% to as protein, and the rest of it, 40-45% to comes from carbohydrates. I've done low-carb diets in the past, 
but my objective biomarkers and subjective physical performance are greater when I eat more carbs. So an intake of around 40 to 45% of carbs has given me the best results. And my biomarkers related to glucose metabolism are also excellent. For example, my fasting blood sugar is 89 mg per deciliter, hemoglobin A1c is 5% and triglycerides are below 50 mg per deciliter, which are all in the lowest risk category for heart disease and mortality. My main carbohydrate sources are vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, beetroot, potatoes, sweet potatoes, berries like strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, and fruit like apples, kiwis, oranges, and pears. I also eat some grains every once in a while like buckwheat, rice, or sourdough bread, but that's like once or twice a month. My daily carbohydrate intake is around 200 grams per day, and I'm getting 30 to 40 grams of fiber per day. The final component of my diet that I want to share with you is innovative fasting or time-restricted eating. Here's what it looks like for me. I fast around 16 hours and then I have a whey protein shake with collagen. That gives me around 30 to 40 grams of protein. Then I work out in the afternoon for about an hour. After my workout, I have dinner at 5 p.m. My first meal is the main course with the meals I've talked about. Fish, vegetables, potatoes, etc. Then I also top it off with a dessert, which is just unflavored yogurt mixed with protein powder and added berries and fruit. Sometimes I'll just eat cottage cheese directly. This is something I do for the sake of time management and personal preference. It's also a useful tool for adhering to a lower calorie intake, which is important because overeating calories and being overweight is one of the biggest risk factors for early death and heart disease. All of the information about diet and food is useless if you become overweight. It doesn't really matter what kind of a diet you follow if it makes you overweight. For me, time restricted eating makes this process much easier. I don't need to do intermittent fasting to lose weight, as I've been lean with low body fat on a regular three meals a day as well, but time restricted eating makes this process so much easier, at least for me. I also don't have any fear of muscle loss because I eat enough protein in my eating window. So that's an overview of my evidence-based diet for longevity. I know a lot of people are gonna be upset. You didn't mention this food, you're eating this food, this is bad, <laughs> etc. But it doesn't matter. I am subjectively speaking and objectively speaking in excellent health and I also have the studies to back it up. Here's a quick summary of my diet. I get about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of protein, which is 120 to 130 grams per day. I get my protein primarily from fish, yogurt, cottage cheese, whey protein, eggs, beans, and some meat. My fat intake is around 35% of total calories, so around 70 to 80 grams, mostly from fish, olive oil, and dairy. My carb intake is around 40 to 45%, and I'm getting around 200 grams per day, mostly from potatoes, beetroot, carrots, fruit, and vegetables. If you want to check out my evidence-based workout routine, then check out this video. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem, stay optimized, stay empowered.